All right, let's jump back in. History of Western Civilization, the 13th century. So the 13th century is from 1200 to 1299. And this is sometimes called the greatest century. There's a lot that happens in here. And if you're familiar with this century, if you're the one who's presenting this one with your poster, you know, there's, I'm going to skip a lot. Okay, you're going to go, hey, she didn't mention, hey, what about, okay. Things that I know you already know, for example, are not going to get brought up during this lecture um, because you already know them. And we're going to spend the time trying to get that big picture idea of what's going on um, in the whole entire Europe West Christendom area. Um, so, uh, you know the drill, watch the whole thing. Um, definitely check out the sources at the end and acknowledge all of the people whose work I am using here. So, here we go. Okay, we're going to start with a meme because um, why not, right? So, the year is 1201, and around this time, in the Andes region in South America, um, the Inca ruler, Mano, uh, sorry, Manco Capac, oversees the construction of a city, which becomes a city-state, kind of like um, in ancient Greece, an independent, self-ruling state called Cusco. Um, and this becomes a humongous kingdom, all right, as you see from the humorous image shown, a very, very big kingdom in Central South America. Uh, the Andes sort of run along the west side, the west coast of um, of South America, and Cusco is is central in that area. So, funny picture, ha ha. And that wasn't enough. We're gonna keep using the memes because sometimes you just other people's art is funny, and you want to share it. Okay, so we did Crusades last century. This is where the crusade thing starts to get weird and confusing and disappointing and a bunch of other sad things. Um, so we continue to use the memes because A, they are memorable, and because B, they are lighthearted. And this is very heavy, very serious material, and we're doing it in a very unusual way. And um, yeah, so here we go. <clears throat> We're going to actually use more than one slide for the same thing here for just a second, so bear with me. <clears throat> in 1202, the Fourth Crusade is currently underway. Um, the Fourth Crusade is pretty much a direct response to the Third Crusade. Pope Innocent III is disappointed that the Third Crusade didn't cover, uh, recover Jerusalem, so we're going to try again. All right. Um, the Western kings, uh, the England, France, Holy Roman Empire kings that we've had are pretty broke, right? Remember, they've been doing things like mortgaging their duchies. <laughs> um, so they make a deal with, who do you think? We just mentioned who is really starting to become wealthy and influential in Europe? The Venetians. Okay, we make a deal with Venice. Hey, you do the transportation. We'll do the fighting and dying, and it's going to be great. Okay. And um, the Venetians are like, cool. Actually, that sounds good. You can actually do us a favor because we don't have an army. Would you do us a favor uh, and attack this other place? So, um, Enrico Dandolo, or Dandolo of Venice, is the leader of the crusade. And he takes the fourth crusade to the Christian city of Zara. And they attack Zara. Because, I don't know, I guess they owe them money, right? Okay, so poor Innocent, Innocent III, he's like, okay, go save the Holy Land. And then the very first thing they do is go attack a Christian city. And then, as you see in the meme on the left, they're going to go to Constantinople next. Why? Okay. Um, so, well, they, they apologize for attacking Zara. Um, and the Pope says, okay, here's your absolution. And they start on their way again and immediately do the next dumb thing. Okay, they don't go to the Holy Land, they go to Constantinople. Okay, so what do they do? Uh, they go to Constantinople, they besiege Constantinople. They didn't just go, they besiege Constantinople, then conquer and sack the city. All right, this is a sad, bad, low point 
okay, in Western history, not going to beat around the bush. This is bad. It's a bad thing to do. And this makes the existing religious break between the East and the West. Okay, when was the Great Schism, right? 1054, we break. This is the last straw. It is complete, permanent. There is no healing the break after this. Okay, so fire destroys most, most of the city. The emperor runs away. <laughs> he flees. Um, the Venetians and the Crusaders make an agreement. How they're going to split up the booty um, is very, very bad. <laughs> Uh, Pope Innocent III does not really personally have any part in all this. Um, like we said, at the beginning, he's like, hey, go get the Holy Land, and they go to Zara. He's like, no, that was bad. And they say, okay, sorry. And now they do this. Okay, clearly the Pope does not have control over what's happening. However, once the deed is done, um, he's really kind of happy to be able to take advantage of the fall of Constantinople in, in this sense. He is able to put a Latin, so a Roman bishop, in charge of these areas, I should say Roman bishops, more than one, in these areas that have been in schism, all right? So he's trying, or he's going to try to, um, to heal the breach since now, all right, we're in charge, fine. Okay, well, we'll put people in charge. We'll try and get it all put back together. It doesn't happen. Um, the people in these areas basically ignore the Roman prelates, ignore the Roman bishops, and they still try and follow the Eastern bishops that they've had all along. Um, there's no fixing it. Okay, despite the Pope's efforts to um, get something good out of a bad situation, make the best of it, it does not happen. And in the meantime, Jerusalem continues to be held by Muslims, and uh, the Fourth Crusade is basically not just a failure, but creates a whole new box full of serious problems all on its own. All right, so no more memes. Sorry, we're done now. Okay, so, and we're only at 12.06. Here we're like almost 10 minutes in, and we've gone three years. So, um, a group of Turks living in an area called the Turfan Depression, which is just this really wide valley in China, are overrun by this group called the Mongols. Who's in charge, right? Well, we talked about him last century. Genghis Khan is the leader. And in 1214, these Mongols have made their way from this obscure river valley all the way to Beijing, to the capital of the Chinese Empire. They, they ravage the countryside in every way. They um, gather up uh, loot. You know, they're taking property, they're taking slaves, they're taking whatever else they feel like taking. And they're also gathering information, okay? They, they're, um, Genghis Khan is known as a great military um, strategist as well. And they're looking at, hey, how is the empire being run? Did, are there fortresses? What do their soldiers do? Things like that. And then the Mongols will pull back to these northern frontier passes and sort of um, regroup. So it's not good. Okay, now we're back in England. So the year is 1214. Now, King John of England wants his stuff back this will not surprise you all right uh, the bad news the good news is you already know this the english and the french don't agree the bad news is they're going to keep doing this for hundreds of years and it's very hard to keep it all straight that's okay john of england wants his fiefs in normandy and anjou returned to him so he sets up an alliance with the holy roman emperor otto the fourth like, hey emperor help me get my stuff okay fine they start a war, but Philip Augustus of France defeats the English at a battle um, at a place called Bovine. So um, this painting is of Philip Augustus almost buying the farm. Uh, he falls off his horse and is saved like at the literal absolute last second by his per personal bodyguard. Um, 
but the French, despite this bad moment, do still win the battle. Now, Bovine is a pivotal, important word, pivotal battle in English and, and thus in American history. We've never heard of it. Have you ever heard of it? No, no one's ever heard of it because it was an embarrassing loss. <laughs> the English king wasn't even there, right? And there's all these guys running off and being generally uninspiring. This is not a battle for the history books for the English in terms of inspiration and national spirit. However, this loss at Bovine leads directly to the key event for this century. So who has the key event for this century? What is it? The big letter. Okay. So, frustrated by the growing power of the king, the English nobles join together and they force King John to sign a document that they hope will protect them from imprisonment, loss of property, um, things like that, without getting some kind of trial. And they want a trial by jury of their peers. Okay, their injuries and deaths at Bovine had kind of been like a last straw. Their lives, their income, their money has been used over and over to help the king regain territory that really only benefits him and not them. Okay, so the British noblemen, the British lords, the British barons, whatever you want to call them, are reasserting their rights as individuals in the Magna Carta. Okay, so again, I said pivotal a minute ago. Fundamental. This is a fundamental moment. This is an important document in common law, which is the legal system that we have. Okay. Yes, it's an old document. Only three of the clauses as they're written are still in effect <laughs> because the rest of them have been superseded by or clarified by some more recent law. Though if you think about it, the fact that in something that was signed over 800 years ago, there are lines in here that are still literally the exact law. It's still pretty amazing. But anyway, the precedent is set here for people to tell the ruler how he's going to rule. Hey, king, here's where your rights end and ours begin. Okay. Um, it's not quite the Constitution <laughs> or anything like that, but it is an important moment. Okay, so again, this is not, some people say this is when the English lords rebelled against the king no this is when the english lords said hey now this is how it's been yeah you're you're the king but you rule because we've agreed to keep you in that position right and make sure that the the pinnacle ruler the king the emperor whoever it is um is bearing his own responsibilities toward the people that he rules Anyway, Magna Carta 1215 is the date. Important. What else happens in 1215? A lot happens here at the beginning of the century, in case you haven't figured it out. Okay, so the Fourth Lateran Council meets in Rome in 1215 to enact legislation. Yeah, that's like put out laws um, discussing what is heresy, what is not heresy, things like this. Okay, they're trying to figure out some basic laws for behavior as far as being Catholic and church goes. So again, we are not hashing out sacraments. We're not hashing out um, the many theological things in terms of, well, was Jesus a God or a man or both? We're past all that. Um, most of the things that we're trying to figure out in 1215 are... Um, our life of the church laws, for example. How often are you required to go to confession? Do, will priests get married? Are priests allowed to gamble or, um, you know, engage in trade? Okay, um, are marriages going to be things that the church is involved in or is that sort of like the state is in charge? All these kinds of things. All right. So those, none of those are real. Are questions of doctrine, like um, how many sacraments are there and things like that. All right. They have more to do with what are the laws of the church 
what does it look like for me to be a Catholic? Right? And how is the church going to run itself? Okay, some other things are um, are mentioned in here. For example, the La this Fourth Lateran Council kind of further cements the negative relationship that the church has with people, with the Jewish people and Jewish communities in general. Um, there is no central Jewish church, right, the way there is a Catholic church. Um, but the Jewish communities tend to have a pretty rough time at the hands of the Christians. So um, Jews, for example, according to the council documents, the Jews are required to wear some kind of special clothing that set them apart from the Christians. Why? So that people didn't accidentally marry a Jew, right? Same rules for Muslims, too. They also had to wear something special. Okay, so that's kind of weird, right? What the heck? What? Is that seriously the best way they had to tell that somebody was Jewish? Hey, you need to wear a, you know, a yellow badge or whatever. Um, what does that tell you about the state of everyone, including the Christians? The Catholics. What did their outward worship look like such that you might accidentally marry a Jew and not know it, right? You might accidentally marry a Muslim, okay? That should make it pretty clear that not everybody was exactly, uh, you know, brushing their teeth and showing up to Mass every Sunday, okay? So your ability to look at someone from the outside and gauge their religion was clearly not the way we would expect it to be today. Um, regardless, regardless, not nice treatment for the Jews. Uh, they're also singled out for other things. For example, they were not allowed to charge high interest on loans um, if the loan was to a Christian, and they um, had to pay special taxes that the Christians did not have to pay. So it's very much like other people had used to do to the Christians. Right, very similar to what the Muslim uh, kingdoms are doing to the Christians and Jews. Um, so. All right, you know what? Let's have another crusade. What's the worst that'll happen? So in 1217, the Fifth Crusade begins. It was planned by Pope Innocent III, okay, um, but will die before it's over. Um, the purpose of, of the Fifth Crusade is to rescue Jerusalem from the Muslims. There you go. However, this crusade has a little bit of a different feel. It's not like the popular movements with the preachers and the big parades that the previous crusades had been, okay? It starts um, a little bit more practically um, with small scale military operations against the powers that are, um, against the individuals and groups that are in power in Syria, okay? And they sort of pick off these little areas one at a time, or they try, and that actually makes them initially more successful because the Muslim opposition to this crusade is divided. Um, however, does it succeed in the end? No. Like the other crusades, um, the Fifth Crusade is, is really not a win for the Catholics, for the Crusaders. They are campaigning far from home, there's always some additional unexpected cost or delay or weather or disaster or plague. Um, they tend to be disorganized. And by 1220, the Muslim forces have, um, have united again and they're able to drive back the Crusaders. So that's the end of the Fifth Crusade. Um, this painting is the capture of Damietta which was an early victory during this crusade, and it was painted in 1625. I like this one. I think it's funny that the, the ships are like sitting on top of the water. I'm not sure if this guy ever really saw boats in water. It's a cool painting. All right, back to the fun stuff. So, in 1219, Genghis Khan sends envoys west to the borders of his frontier. That was not helpful. The borders of the frontier is redundant. He sends them to the western frontier, 
to the border of his empire and is wanting to establish trade routes into the West. All right. And instead, his envoys are killed. So that's just rude. And so he gets upset. Then he just takes the entire army westward and he overruns existing huge um, prosperous cities like Samarkand and Bukhara. And there are a few like that. And if you're looking at the map and you're following me from east to west, Samarkand is only like halfway here. So he's obviously just getting started. Okay. There's a lot of west over here that the the Genghis Khan and the Mongols are going to overrun. So, do we need a meme for Genghis Khan? Of course you do. All right, what's going on here? So, this is it's a meme. This is a reference to a sort of partial myth. Um, it's, it's a little bit true, it's mostly not. So, people will say, oh, the Mongol invasions killed so many people, it actually improved air quality. Okay, if I were Snopes, I'd be like, that is mostly not true. <laughs> Scientists in 2010 did a study of how major disasters, and they, they chose several disasters to test this on, would impact something very specific and, and measurable in terms of um, computer simulation. And that is deforestation. What happens when there are no trees? What happens when there are lots of trees, all right? Uh, there are some facts involved. Uh, for example, agricultural land does not trap carbon dioxide the way a forest does. Okay, that's, that's no real, like, that's not like a political statement. That's pretty straightforward. Trees absorb carbon dioxide. A bunch of oak trees absorb more carbon dioxide than a yard full of grass. So, the scientist theory was if deforestation increases the amount of free carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which it does, then letting the forest grow would decrease the amount of free carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? Sure, okay, so we're all good. So, turns out, we do some modeling, the Black Death, with an estimated 25 million deaths across Europe over a decade really wouldn't even cause like a blip in the computer models. That's how much atmosphere there is. <laughs> That's how many trees there are. However, the model, the Mongol conquests, which deaths were es are estimated between 30 and 40 million people killed by the Mongol hordes, um, did cause a computer model to see um, carbon dioxide concentrations reduce by, wait for it, 0.1 parts per million. So, not a big difference. And there you go. It was a funny meme, and then I ruined it with a bunch of history and science and numbers, and you're welcome. Back to our friend, Philip. Philip Augustus. In 1223, Philip Augustus, King of France, dies. Womp womp, he's dead. Um, in the, over the course of his lifetime, he had greatly expanded the territory of the French monarch and has turned France into both a maritime, that would be the sea, and commercial power. France is a fortified city. This is a picture, this is a modern picture of the wall in um, Paris, you can go see it today, that Philip built. Um, there's a university, it attracts students from all over the world, but especially all over Europe. Okay, so Philip is important because he is the first person who actually calls himself King of France. I am the King of France. So how long ago, ages ago, how long ago did I mention to you France is called the eldest daughter of the church. And we talked about those French kings, right? We talked about Clovis, the Merovingian kings. We talked about several groups of people 700 years ago. And we've been saying France ever since. This guy, 700 years after the death of Clovis, Philip Augustus, is the first person who's actually going to call himself the king of France, right? 
So that gives you an some perspective on how old these countries are, right? And how long they had some kind of history before they got the names that we use for them today. Um, this is very important. Um, when you were studying at the beginning of the year, and talk, we talked about liberalism and everything that's happening after the French Revolution and nationalism, okay, the, the borders of a place, the national identity of a place um, is a new idea and it is much less natural than the religious and cultural and ethnic sometimes, usually the first two, things that made people decide they were a group, okay? There were no borders of France for the last 700 years, but there was definitely a thing that we would say is, oh, this is part of French history, right? I'll keep going. What's this? So, 1225, the manufacture of cotton cloth has begun in Spain. They didn't think it up. Okay, cotton has been brought from Egypt. It's not a new thing. So the Muslims bring cotton from Egypt. And within a 100 years, that's going to become an extremely common fiber and used for cloth almost everywhere in Europe. It spreads very, very quickly. Everywhere you can grow it, they're growing it. And everywhere you can't grow it, they're buying it. Okay. Um, what were they wearing before this, you ask? Uh, linen, <laughs> which is another fiber made from a plant, uh, or wool. And that, that was, those are your options. Linen, which is light for summer, and wool, which is heavy for winter, and that there are no other options. Which, to me, that really explains why silk was so expensive, right? Um, so cotton is going to become a better option than wool, a cheaper option than linen and silk, and um, fascinating. I said we weren't going to talk about him much, but also in 1225, our friend Thomas Aquinas is born in a town called Roca Seca, which I will mention now because that is the same town my great great grandmother is from and all of her family. It's like an hour south of Rome if you're riding a train, so. All right, so in 1227, Genghis Khan dies. Um, he's out fighting uh, in northwestern China against a group called the Tangut, and he dies. There's a little bit of debate how he died. Some people say he fell off his horse and that killed him. Uh, others say he was killed in the battle and there's no horse falling. Others say uh, he was killed in the battle but that's why he fell off the horse. Other people say he was just injured and then he died of the injury after the battle. There's no horse involved at all. The world will never know. The point is, he died. Genghis Khan is dead. And what do the Mongols need to do? They need to decide on their next leader. So that's a whole story that we're not going to tell. Instead, we're going to go back and do some more crusades. In 1228, Frederick II, some Holy Roman Emperor, um, committed to Pope Gregory IX. Yes, I will lead a crusade. I will do that. But then he kind of kept dithering about it. He asked for extensions. He gave reasons he couldn't really go. He said he would go, and then he didn't. Anyway, eventually the Pope gets frustrated by these failures to carry out a duty, and he excommunicates the Emperor. Okay. Um, the Sixth Crusade goes ahead and starts, though. They leave um, from Brindisi, you see, is in um, southern Italy. They do leave from Brindisi with Frederick in the lead and still excommunicated. Okay. And on the way, he has to, there has to be some correspondence and some apologizing and forgiveness. But anyway, he finally agrees to go. Because he says, all right, well, I want to take over control of Jerusalem. I think it. I'm the rightful king of it anyway through marriage. So he does finally set out, and that's the beginning of the Sixth Crusade. 
Meanwhile, other things are going on. Gregory the Ninth is the Pope who was visited by this strange dude from Assisi in Italy. And the guy's like, hey, I want to have a weird group that no one's ever done before where it's, we're men, we live in a house, it would be like a monastery, but we're not going to be monks, we're going to be like going out and preaching and begging. And Pope is like, that is super weird, no, you can't do that. And then this happens. This um, is a painting by Giotto showing maybe not the most important moment in Gregory the Ninth's life, but a very important moment in Gregory the Ninth's life. He has a dream about Francis of Assisi. Okay, and in the dream, among other things, he sees this little dude holding up a church building as it crumbles, and it and it is put back into place. And the Pope is like, okay, never mind. Definitely, you can do whatever you want. Whatever your friar dudes are going to do, we're not sure. It's new and confusing, but I trust this message from God. And you all know the story of St. Francis, so I'm going to let that go just for now. You understand where he fits in history. So the same pope who is um, trying to reform the church from within, okay? Gregory also creates the thing that we know today as the Inquisition, and who's trying to run this crusade to get the Holy Land back, is also the one who dreamed about St. Francis. Who takes over for Genghis Khan? Lucky us, he had a son <laughs> who was um, obviously in a position to inherit rule. Um, so, and that's Ogadai. So Ogadai Khan is like cut from the same cloth, very much a strong leader, takes over for Genghis Khan. He goes into Korea, he puts down a rebellion in Korea, and then in 1234 completes the conquest of China. So, under his rule, the Mongol Empire will be expanded to its greatest size, which on the map we have is the darker orange, it's really dark yellow, okay, um, and that is the Great Khanate. Okay, that is the mongol territory and all these yellow places all around it are areas which either send tribute to the great khan <laughs> to keep from getting destroyed or the ruler themselves is basically a puppet who was put into power in that place by the khan it, either way it doesn't matter there's one big boss and he basically rules asia which is pretty pretty amazing so in 1240 Ogadai dies, okay, and so this this extreme left end line is the furthest westward the Mongols get before all the warlords just go home. What ha you know? Why did the Mongols stop short of taking over all of Europe? Because Ogadai died, and they turned around and went home to have an election. So, like, how, not boring, but, like, how orderly is that? Like, oh, what, you know, the wild Mongol hordes, and then they get a phone call, and they're like, oh, sorry, guys, we're going to have to burn your town a different day. We got to go home and sit quietly and have a debate and an election. I think that's funny. In North America, a Mexica people. The Mexica, they're, they're a group of Aztecs, find this infertile, dry, hilly, not particularly appealing area in central Mexico, and they establish what will become Mexico City, or Chapultepec, which is apparently their name for grasshopper. Okay. So, in 1256, the Mongols have resumed their, their conquesting, but they're actually focused right now on Asia Minor. So, they're on their way to Baghdad, okay? In 12, 1258, um, an army that includes 
a Mongol army that includes Christians and Shia Muslims, attack the city of Baghdad, which is the spiritual capital of the Sunni Muslims, and the Abbasid Caliphate comes to an end. So, maybe not m most people, maybe not everybody, most people would say this date, okay, 1256, sorry, 1258, 1258 is the end of the golden age of Islam, okay? Um, when the art and the philosophy and the science and mathematics and that kind of stuff, when all that was happening, <clears throat> this is the end of it. Because once the Mongols come and burn your town, there's no more philosophy after that, okay? So that's, that's accurate. This is the first big thing. Um, but there's a second one. Um, this picture, by the way, was, is from the 1400s. And this, is, this shows the caliph of Baghdad being imprisoned in a room where all of his treasure is. Okay, in 1269, we're, just, we're going back to the Jews a little bit. Um, in the wars between the King of England and the barons, the Jews are, are usually considered somehow the king's agents. Okay, whether that is true or not, people believed or people would say, oh, you know, the Jews are the king's secret agents. The Jews are, you know, instruments of the king's oppression or whatever. And so it's very common for Jewish communities to be attacked and the inhabitants to be killed. Okay, um, it is true the Jews did have a relationship with the king. He had been borrowing money from them, right? Um, but when he switches to Italian bankers, he's not dependent on them anymore. And now, not just the people, but the King of England as well, <clears throat> is going to kind of turn against the Jews. Um, they're restricted from holding land. Jewish children are restricted or forbidden or barred from inheriting their parents' money. Instead, when a Jew dies, his money goes to the government. And um, all kinds of stuff like this, right? Very similar to things that had happened. There's a very long list of stories where Jews are falsely accused of crimes, used as scapegoats, generally badly treated by the authorities. So I have mentioned before, really seems like anytime anything goes wrong, the first people to get in trouble, to be in, in, a, in a bad spot, rather, are, are the Jews. And that is true keeps on happening. Meanwhile, in 1273, Rudolf, Count Rudolf, a wealthy German noble, is elected from among all the other German princes. He's elected by the German princes to be Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, so it's Rudolf I, and he is a Habsburg. So they elected Rudolf himself personally because he didn't seem to be very ambitious or threatening it's kind of mediocre and so they felt that would make it easy for the emperor to be controlled by their political factions um so this is this is rudolph in the center and um on the left side is the Habsburg family coat of arms and then on the right side that's Rudolph's personal coat of arms. And you can see the family crest down inside. <coughs> um, you may see him named Rudolph of Germany, Rudolph King of the Romans, Rudolph of Habsburg, a um, couple different titles. Okay. Um, this is just very quickly. This is kind of a view of Europe. At the end of the 13th century. The German Empire is the same thing as the Holy Roman Empire. You see the Mongols, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, that's the Mongols. At the top of the yellow Novgorod and Vladimir are Russian towns, the Empire of Rus, currently being taken over by the Mongols, but they're still up there. The Khanate of Persia, the green that's cut off at the corner, 
That's the Seljuk Turks. They're the ones that are controlling the Holy Land. You see a lot of Spain is back in Christian hands. Portugal, Castile, Aragon, and Navarre are mostly Catholic controlled. Okay. And the German Empire is going to expand again into that area that's marked Hungary right now. Just kind of gives you a picture. It's starting to look starting to look like the Europe that we would recognize today. All right, so here we go. How does the crusading era end? The Muslims win, basically. In 1291, the crusaders give up the last of their territory in the Middle East. Um, they're on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, all the way down to where they just hold the city of Acre. And they're eventually driven out of Acre itself by the Mamelukes. So there had been crusaders. Um, yes, they lose a lot, but some Christian presence had been in the Middle East for almost 200 years. Okay, A lot of those years were, were relatively peaceful, right, between the Crusades and, and um, in many areas of the Middle East. It was somewhat, you know, they had... For example, trade relationships, they had commerce, the the history and science and medicine and philosophy that I mentioned the Muslims had brought from the ancient Greeks is learned by crusaders during the same time, okay? But um, a loss at Acre <laughs> and a lot of dead guys in, between, in the meantime is really the sum of all these Christians' results. Um, efforts to take over, take back the Holy Land. Okay. Um, this is an 1841 oil painting called the Siege of Acre. And then there's the map. All right, we're almost there. 1291. Um, this is an image, this is literally a picture of the document. This is an image of the Federal Charter of 1291, which is a, re a record of an agreement between three cantons, which are basically counties, they're like little provinces, in Switzerland, agreeing to um, sort of form a joint government, um, mutual military defense and commerce and things like that so it's a federal charter because they are a federation they're going to be a, a group of independent entities and i honestly i pulled this because i thought it was really cool unlike most of these famous old documents this one still has some of the wax seals intact so those things hanging off the bottom um, stuck to the bands which would have been used to hold the rolled up document shut like you roll it up and then you tie it closed. These seals, wax seals, would have been on the bands. Um, so the Magna Carta, some of the Roman law documents we've looked at, um, those, all of those things would have had at least one, usually many wax seals. This one has three because it's one for each of the counties. I thought that was neat to be able to see it. Okay. Something bad is about to happen. We're going to get to most of it next century, but in 1296, this, the stage is set. A conflict between King Philip IV of France and Pope Boniface VIII is going to become ugly. Okay, It boils down to taxation. Is the king allowed to tax church property? If churches collect taxes, do they get to keep the money? Okay, and Pope Boniface issues a bull, a papal bull, which asserts the church's authority and rights when in conflict with the secular head of state. Okay, and Philip is like not really interested in this. He says he's going to keep the church from collecting taxes and, you know, and there's a lot of drama. 
okay? Uh, if you remember your Dante, this is the Pope, Pope Boniface VIII, was not yet dead <laughs> when Dante was writing, but Dante puts him in hell, okay? He lives in the eighth circle of hell because of sins of simony, which is selling spiritual things, spiritual favors for money, okay? Like selling indulgences. We're going to have problems with that soon, right? Um, Boniface was a very strong player on team church needs to have temporal power, right? We've talked about why. Why do the popes, why do the bishops, why do they think they need to have this temporal power, right? If they don't have control, they can't decide how the church gets ruled. And here it's happening, okay? The king of France is trying to tell the pope where and when he can collect money. Okay, for the support of the church. That's me, problem. But first, in thir by 1300, um, we talked about the towns and agriculture is growing. And we have that warming, the area that, I'm um, sorry, the time, time period of warm weather. And now something that we call, the, we now call the Little Ice Age is beginning. Okay, so generally the weather, you know, there's more rain. The weather was wetter. Um, the growing season is shortened, and um, it's in, it's just cold. It's colder <laughs> most of the time than it had been for several hundred years. So farm expansion in Western Europe comes to an end. Um, they, they're still farming, but it's less. Um, it's it's harder to do. It's less common. Um, raising cattle will decline because cattle need a lot of space and a lot of food and that's expensive and um, that reduces the amount of protein in everybody's diets it takes away a source of manure for fertilizer okay so in general there's just a decline in um, productivity and also in health um, people are not as um, as healthy because they don't have as broad as a well-rounded diet and that's it you made it. Congratulations. Another long century. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Check the sources. Okay. Remember what I said, what I always say about the F. Smitha. It's really nice to have everything laid out in order. Make sure you look somewhere else. Um, especially I've added in the last couple centuries, I've added newadvent.org. I haven't pointed that out to you specifically. That's a really good website. That's where I get a lot of saint biographies. When do the saint of the day? That's where I get um, some of those. So it's a good place to look. And I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.